like most New Yorkers, my first encounter with the, uh, the genius of Roz Chast was in The New Yorker. Her cartoons made me smile, made me cringe or nod in agreement, and of course sometimes just laugh out loud. Um, I thought Roz was brilliant and nervous and funny and so incredibly talented and insightful. I connected with her wit and with her honesty, particularly when it came to those cartoons about her mother. Um, I thought, she's from Brooklyn, I'm from the Bronx, there's some complicated stuff going on there, Roz Chast gets me, you know? And I later felt that connection in a richer and really deeply personal way as a daughter as I read and reread Roz's memoir, Can We Talk About, Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant um, during the final years of my own parents' lives. Again, Roz Chas got me. There are Roz Chas books with great titles and themes like Going Into Town, A Love Letter to New York, What I Hate from A to Z, and the best title ever, The Party After You Left. Um, <laughs> there are painted eggs and embroidery and hand-hooked rugs, her collection of cans, um, and again, more than a thousand cartoons published in The New Yorker over 40 years. Roz Chast is the winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award. Her work has been shortlisted for the National Book Award. She is the winner of the New York City Literary Honor and Humor, as well as the Rubin Award from the National Cartoonist Society, the Kirkus Prize, and the Heinz Award for the Arts and Humanities. Roz Chast was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2013, and most recently into the Harvey Award Hall of Fame. She holds honorary doctorates from Pratt, the Art Institute of Boston at Lesley University, and Dartmouth College. Roz is as funny in email as she is on paper, and she's super smarty pants. She's gracious and forgiving, which was a relief to me that you'll understand when you spot the little mistake I made in her show catalog. Um, and so it is my absolute pleasure and honor to introduce the 2018 recipient of the 30th Annual SVA Master Series Award and Exhibition, Ross Chast. Well, I'd like to start out with this slide that you've been looking at and explain it a little bit um, to let you know a little bit about me and where I'm coming from. Some years ago, I was asked by a magazine to submit a photograph of myself as a child. And I said, is it okay if I do a drawing instead? And they said, sure, knock yourself out. So I have this drawing of me. I'm on my bed. I'm nine years old. And I'm reading the big book of horrible, rare diseases. Um, I'm surrounded by other books, such as A Child's Garden of Maladies, uh, diseases of the tropics, everything you always wanted to know about scurvy, but were afraid to ask. You know, some of these, these diseases when I was growing up just had these sort of very evocative names. Lockjaw Monthly. Now, when I was a kid, lockjaw was a very, a big thing that we worried about. I'm not quite sure why. Um, but everybody I knew, we knew what lockjaw was. Uh, you got it from like getting rust in a cut. And that just seemed to happen to me like 20 times a day. So uh, it's kind of like a miracle that I've never got it. But um, the book here that really explains a lot about me, and it was sort of the Bible in our house, is the Merck Manual, um, which is, uh, we had that in our house, not because either of my parents were in the medical profession, but my aunt was a registered nurse, and she always gave my mother outdated copies of the Merck Manual. And uh, which my mother read and notated, and she was, she, you know, that was her thing. And I would pick it up from time to time, and I didn't understand most of it, but I did know what symptoms and signs were. And I knew that leprosy was very rare in Brooklyn. Um, but it didn't mean that, like, if my fingers felt a little tingly, you know, that they weren't about to, like, just drop off onto the living room floor. Um, 
Anyway, I'm going to show a bunch of cartoons and then get into other stuff. Uh, this is Pigeon Little. The sky is falling. The sky is, oh, look, part of a bagel. Um, uh, this is the fountain of puberty. Um, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever, like, st stood outside of a middle school and watched kids come out, but um, it's really funny. Uh, uh, this is self-help books for the newly dead. Uh, five people you should avoid in heaven, eating for eternity, and who moved my urn? Um, this is when moms dance. And, you know, a lot of times people ask me, where, do you, where did you get your ideas for cartoons? And a lot of times I can't tell them, but this particular cartoon did come from life. When my kid was around 15 or 16, one of them, she was doing her homework in the living room. And, you know, there's almost nothing that's more disgusting in the eyes of a teenager than the adult human body. And in a, a point of view with which I more or less agree. But um, if you really want to gild that lily of disgust, just like do a little kind of, you know, dance. And uh, so, she, so I did. And she looked up. I was just sort of seeing if she was paying attention. She looked up and she said, Mom, stop. You're hurting me. Um, so, uh, this is a sort of, <laughs> yeah, uh, um, and this is not in the mood for a human interaction line. Um, this is a, a bajillion to one and, yeah, I don't know. Uh, so I love tombstone jokes. Uh, I hate kale. I don't know. There's something just sort of, it's an ornamental plant. I've, I don't know. It's not food. Um, this is insomnia jeopardy. Um, ways in which people have wronged me, stri strange noises, diseases I probably have, money troubles, why did I do or say that, and ideas for a screenplay. Um, <laughs> this is uh, Obit Man. Um, I don't know if any of you guys read the obituary pages. Um, I always have. I don't know. I think I just have always been sort of curious. And it's like, if somebody's a year older than me, I think like, oh, well, you know. Um, so uh, this is Curious George Dad. What you doing? You having a Snapchat? You doing Instagram? Did you find any Pokemon? You playing Twitter? No. It's <laughs> Um, this Yenta Theater presents Waiting for Godot. So, where's Godot? He's always late. Maybe something happened to him. I heard he moved to Florida. Um, uh, this is an urban trail mix. Um, you can read what it is. Um, uh, this is airplane mode. Wow, look at that amazing view. We could literally fall out of the sky at any second. Oh boy, here come peanuts. Uh, um, this is an inside of body experience. <laughs> so far, every morning. Um, uh, it's pre bay. Um, I, do, I do like drawing interiors, I must say. Uh, uh, this is uh, just a sort of declension. We have antiques, collectibles, bric-a-brac, and garbage. Um, and this is the cartoon that you saw in the thing. Uh, this is a desk joke. Uh, too early to begin working on and too late to do anything about. Um, this is the freelance life. Um, <laughs> honey, I'm still home. Um, and uh, that leads me into talking a little bit about process. Uh, um, this is a desk where I work. Uh, the way it works at the New Yorker cartoon department is it really hasn't changed incredibly much over 40 years. It hasn't, it hasn't, but it's basically, it's a weekly magazine, and every week there is an art meeting. Um, and this is where I work. Uh, this is my little table um, with all the junk around it. And every week, there's about 40 of us under contract. There's probably a lot more, more people than that than submit. Um, they get, I think I read somewhere, well, if you, if you think 
each one of us submits what we call the batch. And that can be each one of us under contracts. That's 40. It can be any number like from around like five or six to maybe like 15. So let's just say 10 because I'm not great at math. So that's just 400 cartoons that come in every week from um, the contributors, regular contributors. And then there's about another 400 that come in over the transom at least. So that's 800 cartoons a week. Uh, some people bring their stuff in in person. I send mine through cyberspace. Um, it's actual photo of a drawings going through cyberspace. Um, and then they go to an art meeting. And I have never been at one of these art meetings. I have heard about them. I know they exist. But I would not really want to see one in person any more than just the fact that I, I exist. So I know my parents had sex once, but I don't necessarily want to see that. Um, so uh, I don't know what the art meeting looks like, but I imagine it looks a lot like this. Um, the, and the, it's mainly David Remnick, and at this point, Emma Allen is the cartoon editor, and then there's a few other editors. But it's mostly this, because if you think about it, you know, that's 800 cartoons that come in every single week, at least 800. And that Get, gets winnowed down to about 100 for the weekly art meeting. And then they buy something like between 20, 22, to maybe 25 on a good week. So there's, it's mostly rejection, and uh, uh, which is why if somebody asks me, like, you know, my kid wants to be um, a New Yorker cartoonist, I always say, well, if they can do anything else, that's probably the thing they should do. <laughs> Um, because really, it's mostly rejection, and this is these are the file cabinets I have my re, uh, you know rejected drawings in, and at this point they're piled up on top of the cabinets. It's mostly 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 rejection. Um, anyway, this is the very first cartoon that I sold to the New Yorker um, in in 1978, and uh, it's very strange. I never really um, thought that I would wind up doing cartoons for the New Yorker. I always wanted to be a cartoonist from the time I was around 12 or 13. Um, but I thought if I were really, really, really lucky, I would wind up at the Village Voice. That was sort of my secret plan. And uh, I was um, I was starting to sell cartoons. I, you know, I got out of art school. I went to RISD, and I started taking around a portfolio. At first, I started taking around a portfolio of illustrations because I thought, my cartoons are so weird, nobody will buy these cartoons. Um, they don't really fit in anywhere. They're not underground cartoons. They're not overground cartoons. I don't know what they are, but, you know, they're funny to me. So um, anyway, uh, I... Um, I was starting to sell to the, the Village Voice some, and to the National Lampoon, and uh, uh, Mother Jones. And then in April of 1978, my parents subscribed to The New Yorker. I thought, well, I should give them a try, you know. Um, they won't take anything, but I'll just give them a try. So I called them up, found out when their drop-off day was, which is when people can submit stuff over the transom. That just means that you're not on staff and whatever. Um, and I did not even know how to go about this. I just took about, you know, a stack of cartoons about this high, and I put them in an envelope with my card, and I dropped them off. And then I went back the next week, because uh, that's what you do. You go back the next week to pick up your portfolio and look at your rejection slip and then go back to your regular life. Um, and instead of a rejection slip, there was a note from Lee Lorenz, who is the uh, art, the cartoon art editor, actually, because he did everything. He did covers. He did uh, the inside art. He did everything. The art editor at the time, Lee Lorenz, to go back and see him. And uh, I had no idea what this meant. Um, I just knew it was sort of odd. And I still remember I had in my head, you know, like before you something happens, you sort of like imagine what it's going to be like. And I sort of had this picture in my head that I would th be there, and he would say to me, well, little lady, and I do not know why I gave him this like cowboy accent like, at all, because he did not have a cowboy accent, and uh, it was not in the Midwest. It was, you know, on 43rd Street. Um, but he, I, he, I thought he was going to say, well, little lady, uh, these cartoons are mighty interesting, but maybe when you're older, because I was 23, you know, you should come back and see us. But um, instead, 
out of all those cartoons, he pulled out this one, which was the weirdest and most personal of the lot. And he said, we're buying this one. And I was pretty surprised. Um, I think I was kind of speechless. Um, and uh, it, it was, this is the kind of cartoon, I mean, people said, well, what, is it? what does it mean? And it's more like, like, you know, when you're sitting at your desk and you just start making up things and, you know, little shape and, you know, it's a tiv. Well, I do this, you know, maybe you don't do this. Um, you know, I'll make up lists of words, that nonsense words or names that just crack me up or something. Uh, so this, that's what this was. It was just like things that made me laugh um, and I didn't think they would make anybody else laugh, uh, and, um, but apparently they did. So um, he said to start coming back every week, um, which is uh, what I did. And um, I've been pretty much, that's 40 years ago, so I've been pretty much doing this, the same thing, submitting every week, although now, I, as I said before, I submit them um, in a PDF. I, I don't go in in person because I hate that. Um, and nobody needs to see this needy little face, you know? Um, this is another very early cartoon. Uh, uh, that most of them look more like this than the other thing. This is in a quandary. The voice of reason, it's not such a big thing. Just put the galoshes on. The voice of conscience, mom will be mad if you don't put them on. The voice of practicality, it's raining. Why don't you just wear them? The voice of binky, toss them out the window. Um, <laughs> Just say here also that when my cartoon started running in the New Yorker, um, I didn't know this because I was, you know, completely uh, even more than I am now in my own little uh, delusional world. And um, Lee told me later, Lee Lorenz told me later that some of the older cartoonists were so upset by these cartoons, they hated them so much that one of them asked if he owed my family money. Um, uh, this is another early one. Um, uh, I, uh, and this is a re relatively recent cartoon. Um, this sort of sums up like every minute of the day to me, basically. Um, and uh, yeah, and it brings me to this book that I wrote about my parents. Um, and about, it started out, it was just gonna be about the last um, few years of their lives when um, as their only child, I wound up sort of holding the proverbial bag. And, um, it, but then as I was putting it together, I realized I wanted to talk a little bit about their relationship with me, uh, not just at that time, but uh, give a little bit of uh, context and also their relationship with each other and what kind of people they were. Here's a, a photo of them. And I like this photo because, uh, um, you know, this is from like 19... 60 or early 60s, and um, my parents are dressed like it's 1938, uh, which is, I think, the last time they paid any attention to what other people around them were wearing. Um, this is like how they dressed when they went to the beach, you know? Um, anyway, and this is a picture a few years later, um, and I, I, I'm not 45 in that picture, I'm, I'm 11. Um, um, yeah, <laughs> I was not a happy camper. Um, uh, anyway, um, this is these are some of the stories that I heard growing up. Um, I think of this as the Wheel of Doom, and these were all true stories that I heard growing up that had happened to friends of my parents. Friend's husband killed by falling flower pot. Friend nearly blinded by mascara causing infection. Tra friend who traveled too much, jaundice. A rash than dead, a headache than dead, a lump than dead. He was too happy. He jumped off a chair and broke his metatarsal. Guy who almost died after playing the oboe. What is this connection between playing the oboe and death? Well, it's because of this, that my, my mother and her brother, who was a, a jazz trumpet player, they decided, this friend of my uncle's, um, who was an oboe player, that it was so hard to get a note out of that reed playing the oboe, that one morning, because this is the sentence that I overheard that like ruined my life, one morning he woke up and as my uncle told my mother, which I overheard because it was a tiny apartment, he was bleeding from every pore. Um, so yeah, that was from the oboe. Um, 
uh, friend's son killed by baseball. Um, everything ended in death or near death or deafness or blindness. Um, when I was a kid, I remember I found this little like expandable bracelet on the ground and I put it on. My mother said, take it off, it's too tight. Your hand will turn green and drop off. Um, I was not allowed to sit directly on the ground. Why? Because if you sit directly on the ground, you will get a cold in your kidneys and die. Because this had happened to her best friend growing up. She sat on the ground, she caught a cold in her kidneys, and she died. You, you never went swimming without a bathing cap. If you got water in your ears, you might as well just kill yourself. Um, there were so many things that were so, so scary. Um, and yet, my parents and I never discussed death. Uh, so, do you guys ever think about things? And what kinds of things? You know, things, plans. I have no idea what you guys want. Let's say something happened. Am I the only sane person here? You know what, forget it, never mind. Que sera, sera. Later that same day, phew, phew, phew. Like, we, none of us wanted to talk about this. Um, I was quite aware that my parents had had tough lives, way, way tougher than mine. I had heard the stories my whole life about how their parents had come over from Russia at the turn of the century with nothing and how my maternal grandfather had been an engineer in Russia, but how between his inability to speak English and his being Jewish, he wound up barely being able to support five kids and his wife working as a presser in the garment district, and how bitter and angry he was, and how my grandmother washed clothes for other people, and how even sadder my father's family was. His mother was one of nine children. Not only was she the only girl, but she was also the only one of her siblings to survive the Russian cholera epidemic. Then in a forest, her father had his ear cut from, his throat cut from ear to ear by bandits. I don't know what happened to her mother, but she came to New York, married my paternal grandfather, and had just one child, my father, by cesarean section in 1912, a horrible ordeal that involved, according to my mother, opening her up from her neck to her you-know-what. Between their one thing after another lives, one bad thing after another lives in the Depression, World War II, and the Holocaust in which they both lost family, it was amazing that they weren't crazier than they were. Who could blame them for not wanting to talk about death? And my father says, let's discuss a more pleasant subject, which is where the title for this book came from, came from him. My parents referred to each other without any irony as soulmates. The rocks in his head match the holes in mine. They were born 11 days apart, and they grew up two blocks apart in East Harlem, New York City. They were in the same fifth grade class. He was a fat boy in the back of the room. They never dated, much less anything else, anyone besides each other. And my father saying, we were too poor. And I'm like, what? Um, aside from World War II, work, illness, and going to the bathroom, they did everything together. I'm going to wall bounds. Hold on, I'm coming too. My mother even washed my father's hair for him. It's not as if they never fought, because they did. Don't sit sideways, you're twisting your kishkas. Kishkas are intestines, by the way. But the concept of looking for something better, or being happy, that was for modern people, or movie stars, i.e. degenerates. They were a tight little unit. Codependent, of course we're codependent, thank God. Maybe they believed if they just really held on to each other really tightly for eternity, nothing would ever change. And what things really held on really well for a very long time. And at this point, my parents were in their late 80s. I was living up in Connecticut with my family, my two kids, my husband. And about um, like maybe an hour and 15 minutes from Manhattan by car, and then you add another like 45 to an hour from where they lived in Brooklyn, because as I said in the book, they lived in deep Brooklyn, not like, you know, Brooklyn Heights. They lived like, if you look in Brooklyn, and you know Coney Island Avenue, like right in the middle, like halfway between Prospect Park and, and uh, Brighton Beach. So really the deep Brooklyn. And, uh, and since I was not much of a driver, um, I didn't, it was, it was kind of a schlep to go out there, and they were living on their own, and I would visit them periodically. I started to make visits, and it was a little bit weird, because I would, this 
you know, was really what happened. I pick up this oven mitt and I say, Mom, what is with this oven mitt? It's from the year one. It's disgusting. It's all burnt and it's cruddy and it's got patches on it. Who patches an oven mitt, you know? Um, and then I realized something. Oh my God, these patches come from a skirt I made 40 years ago in home ec. And then, you know, you kind of like start to make the connection. It's like that skirt is still somewhere in, the, in this apartment, which is a tiny apartment. And I say, please let me buy you a new oven mitt. And she says, why waste your money? That one still works. By 2002, they were 90. It was hard not to notice that every time I came to see them, the grime had grown thicker, the piles of newspapers, magazines, and junk mail had grown larger, and they themselves had grown frailer. I could see that they were slowly leaving the sphere of TV commercial old age, spry, totally independent, just like a normal adult, but with silver hair. This is like, you know, some 67 or 70 year old guy who's kayaking, you know, not talking about that. And moving into that part of a old, old age that was scarier, harder to talk about, and not a part of this culture. And here's the scientist saying, extend human lifespan till 140. Something was coming down the pike. It's no accident that most consumer ads are pitched to people in their 20s and 30s. For one thing, they are less likely to have gone through the transformative process of cleaning out their deceased parents' stuff. Once you go through that, you can never look at your stuff in the same way. You start looking at your stuff a little post-mortemistically. If you've lived more than two decades as a consumer, you probably have quite the accumulation, even if you're not a hoarder. An ergonomic garlic press and throw pillows and those stupid sunflower dessert plates and seven travel alarm clocks and eight nail clippers and a colander and a flat iron and three old laptops and barbells and a set of fucking bocce balls and patio furniture and an auto harp for God's sake and your old flute from high school and a zillion books and towels and sheets and a walk you never used. Besides their aversion to talking about unpleasant topics, they also had trust issues. Remember the Melmans? Before they died, they signed all their money over to their daughter. And here's their daughter, and she's like taking the bag of money, and she's going, yeah, thanks. And next thing you know, she puts them in a nursing home. Off you go. Off you go. And she buys a drawer full of cashmere sweaters. <laughs> I tried to get them to accept a little bit of help from outside. We don't need any help but they didn't want any strangers in the apartment. My mother insisted that no grocery store in Brooklyn delivered. Occasionally one of their neighbors helped out, but the grime and disorder were worse than ever, way beyond anything a mere tidying up could fix. And this panel has me, I'm looking at an ancient, ancient box of sanitary napkins in the towel closet. And I know from the graphics of the box that these predate the time from when I myself became a woman. <laughs> and it's like covered in this thick layer of dust and thinking like, why didn't these go down the incinerator? Was she, what, was she like gonna make doll beds out of them? I mean, or stuff pillows? Like why didn't she throw them away? It's, it was a mystery. And it was only getting worse. A friend of mine said, you have found the source of the river eBay. But any time I mentioned assisted living, the reaction was extremely negative. You know, these places have like very messed up names, like Sunset Gardens, End of the Trail Acres, uh, Final Bridge, Rest Home. Um, somehow they were able to see through the euphemisms. It's a last stop, a luxury residence for people in their golden years. I mean, who were they, what? <laughs> it's very weird. And finally they were there. I mean, in the book I go into sort of, there was, there were, uh, I mean, they were, it took, um, giving you a shortcut of this, but uh, things happened and eventually they, had, they realized that they could not keep living independently in their apartment in Brooklyn and my living up in Connecticut. It's a little, getting a little crazy um, and unsafe. Um, so finally I found a place about 10 minutes from me and um, here they are moving in and my father says, so what do they call this place, a rest home? No, Dad, it's called assisted living. And then we're walking down this hall and I see these posters that like, they were just heartbreakers. They were so awful. Don't forget the trip to the mall. Jitney leaves the lobby at 1 p.m. And this one was the worst. Tonight's dining room theme is outer space. 
And I'm thinking like, you know, this was not the Alzheimer's wing. This was just old, older people who maybe were frail and needed help getting dressed or taking a shower or something. And I thought like, that's just, just fucking depressing. It's like, why so much infantilizing just because somebody needs, you know, they're not children. I just hated it. Um, Alfonso the Amazing does his magic act tonight. And, uh, but I'm still trying to be like, you know, Miss Brave about it. Um, look, they have a craft center. My mother's thinking my daughter equals nitwit. Um, and look, there's a gym and a little bar if you want to get a drink before dinner and bingo all day long. They have never been to a gym. They don't drink and they don't play bingo. And my mother says, I'm getting fatigued. Let's go back to our room. Well, they were there for a couple of years and um, my father, when he was 95, he, uh, his hip broke. I was gonna say he broke his hip, but the way I've been told it works is that at a certain point, your, your bone might just break while you're standing. It's not like you trip and it breaks. It's like it breaks and then you fall. Um, and, uh, and he died, <laughs> spoiler alert. Um, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> well, and my mother lived another two years. Um, here's what I used to think happened at the end. One day, old Mrs. McGillicuddy felt unwell, and she took to her bed. She stayed there for, oh, about three or four weeks, growing weaker day by day. One day, one night, she developed something called a death rattle. Soon, er, soon after that, she died. The end. Rest in peace, old Mrs. McGillicuddy. Now, you know, this may happen for some people, but especially nowadays when everything can get so, like, drawn out with medical treatments and things, um... The last couple of years were just so not good, and I don't know. I don't know. It just was. Uh, I I learned that it was. A, it just didn't happen like this for a lot of people. That the end could be drawn out in these very painful and um, not good ways. Um, anyway, my mother did die at the age of ninety-seven, um, and. Uh, and that was at how I ended the book. Um, but this funny and odd thing happened a couple of years after the book came out. Um, and this ran in the New Yorker. It did not, it, this is obviously not in the book because it happened a couple of years after the book came out. Um, but I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, this is the epilogue. About a year and a half ago, I received an email from a woman who had read a book I wrote about my parents. Dear Roz Chast, I read your book, blah, 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 but there was a mystery that needed to be solved. Um, I should say here that um, in the book I talk about this a little bit. My parents had another baby before me that died um, uh, at birth, or a couple of days after birth. Um, she reassured me that she wasn't bats, that she was merely curious about where my parents' first baby was buried. My parents never wanted to talk about this. Um, her curiosity led her to a website called Find a Grave, which really does exist, um, where she discovered something she thought I might find interesting. Chast female, died December 21st, 1942, buried Mount Lebanon Cemetery in Queens. I did find it interesting. It was more information than I was able to get from my parents. So I contacted Mount Lebanon, you know, the contact button. And the next day, I received this message. Dear Roz, I believe you have found your sister. I was beyond flabbergasted. Not only had my sister turned up in the archives, but so had my mother's parents. This was all news to me. My, the man at the cemetery sent me photographs of their graves. And that's, those are the actual photographs of my mother's parents. My parents' ashes, which had been in my closet since their deaths in 2007 and 2009, had at last found a home. Several months passed. After all, there was no rush. I mean, really, you know. Um, uh, finally, last fall, my son and I took a subway and then a bus to Glendale, Queens, where Mount Lebanon Cemetery is. I didn't bring the cremains. It was a two-part process, and this part was mainly for paperwork. We met with a man who had found my sister and my grandparents. He showed us a book of archived cemetery maps in the precise place where my sister was buried. He took us to her gravesite, which was unmarked, common in the case of an infant's death. My son and I put stones on her grave. Jews don't put flowers on graves, just stones. He showed us the niche wall where my parents' cremains would be housed. Um, this is where it gets like kind of woo-hoo. Um, it overlooks where your sister is buried. It's the only one left in that wall. 
It's niche J2. <laughs> J2. The apartment where my parents had lived for almost 50 years where I grew up was 2J. And this has all been checked by the New Yorker, so I'm not making this up. I know, if, like if I wrote this in a book, my editor would make me take it out. It's too weird. Um, the other day I returned to Mount Lebanon, this time with a pal and my parents' cremains. I was on, took the subway out. I was tempted to say to my fellow l train passengers, guess what or who is in this bag? A workman drove me out to the niche wall. I carried the bag on my lap. We were joined by a group of workmen at the wall. One of them climbed a ladder, opened the niche, and one by one placed my parents' ashes inside. Then he resealed it and climbed back down. It was time to say goodbye. Anyway, um, yeah, that was a very strange story. Um, and I'm going to show a few more cartoons. Now, I like, I like this cartoon a lot. This is a very early cartoon. It's the Cranes, 1,022,796 West 79th Street. <laughs> And one of the reasons I like to look at this cartoon is because the way it works at the New Yorker is you don't submit finished drawings. You submit sketches for cartoons. And then back then, um, uh, they would, Lee would pull out a cartoon from the little folio on his desk, and he'd say, we're buying this cartoon. And I would take the cartoon home, and I would do a finish of it. I would do a better version of it. And he, he took it out. Now, what I had was like the, the little flag on the side of the mailbox it was like sticking out like perpendicularly from the front of the box. And he said, like, but I have to ask you, like, what, what is that? And I said, oh, that's the handle. That's how you open up the mailbox. And um, he looked at me like I had two heads. And, uh, and then he realized, like, I've never had a mailbox like this because I'd, I'd only lived in apartments, you know. Um, so I had never seen one of these in person, and I actually thought that that little flag on the side was the handle with which you opened up the, the mailbox. Um, and he redrew it. He redrew the mailbox for me to teach me how to draw a mailbox. It's really very sad. Um, but now, like, I don't want to brag, but like, I really know how these work now because I have one. Um, I'm like an expert. I just flip that flag up, you know, like I've been doing it my whole life. Um, uh, anyway, and this. Uh, this is a recent, very recent cartoon. I, I may be living up there in, as my parents used to call the country, um, which is really like a suburb of New York, like an hour north, but my parents called it the country. In fact, when we moved out there, my father asked me, he said, so how many channels do you get out here? <laughs> um, so yeah, this is Beginning Yarder Magazine. Say hello to grass. What the hell is mulch? Rake or hoe, which is which? No, you don't want a pool, plus tons more. And the special story is, so you're outside, now what? Um, and uh, that leads me, this is the latest book that I wrote. It's uh, love, uh, Going Into Town, A Love Letter to New York. And uh, my, this is what my parents used to call going into Manhattan from um, uh, from Brooklyn, they would say we're going into town and we would take the train from Newkirk Plaza in Brooklyn. And uh, this is the, the drawing, this is a photograph of me with my mother at Newkirk Plaza that the drawing on the cover was based on. You can sort of see it. Um, and uh, I, I don't know how many sweaters I'm wearing under that coat. <laughs> I think at least three. Um, I look kind of like my head's about to pop off. It's just not, <laughs> don't look very comfortable, but some of the signs are just so great. Buy tokens at your leisure. It's like not somebody else's leisure, at yours. You know. Um, well, you might say if you love New York, like why did you move out? And it really, it has to do with children and money. Um, when my son, when our son was almost three, and I was pregnant with our second child. My husband, our son, and I left Brooklyn for a pretty leafy suburb about an hour north of Manhattan. There were five main reasons for this leap into the unknown. One, this was 1990, the mi middle of the crack epidemic. We'd had it with crime, the crack files all over the sidewalk, all of it. Mommy, what that? I eat that. <laughs> Two, free excellent public schools where we were going. Three, my parents lived in Brooklyn. For some people, this would have been a plus, but I had mixed feelings. 
Four, sometimes when you grow up in a place, you need to get away. I saw Brooklyn differently from people who came there from Wisconsin or wherever. Behind every cute organic food store, I saw the ghost of the sad, dark, odiferous grocerette of my childhood. There was nothing there for me. Five, but the main reason was, reason was this. We couldn't afford the space we needed. The four-bedroom house we bought in suburbia cost less than a crappy two-bedroom walk-up in Brooklyn, even in 1990. The decision to leave the city was terrifying. And this is us, this is my son saying, must play soccer, need mall now, lawn, extremely important, hell with art, collect thimbles instead. I didn't know how to drive. I didn't like the idea of living directly on top of a boiler or a furnace or whatever the hell was in a house basement. I'd never lived in what my parents called the country. Also, would we turn into Philistines or zombies? And I still occasionally like look out and I, and I think, I own this tree. I own a tree. That's okay. What is more stupid than that? Um, and uh, I took both of my kids into the city a lot when they were growing up. Um, one time, I was with my daughter and she pointed to the fire escapes and she said, Mom, what are all those West Side Story things? Which I, I didn't even know that she knew what the cover of the West Side Story album was. I had no idea how she had sort of put those two things together, but she, but she did. Um, anyway, uh, my daughter did attend SVA. Um, and before she went to SVA, I thought I should sort of check up on her sense of logistics to see how much she understood about the city and the layout. Just basic stuff, you know, like the basic grid. Um, and here's what happened. So I was saying, so if you want to go from 52nd to 55th Street, you walk three blocks uptown. And she actually said to me, what's a block? Um, <laughs> sort of quite a question. Um, so uh, I made her a book. I made her a little booklet, which is what eventually became... Um, the, uh, the going into town book. It was a little guidebook, which she gave back to me at the end of four years and said it had been very helpful. It had things that sometimes guidebooks just don't tell you. They tell you all about, you know, the Statue of Liberty or whatever, but they don't tell you the Fifth Avenue divides the east side from the west side um, and that the numbers go up as you go towards the river. It's just basic stuff. Everybody here knows this, but like if you have never lived in New York, you might not know why 25 West 43rd Street is different from 25 East 43rd Street. Um, the sidewalk in New York is like a thin shell covering a vast honeycomb of pipes and tunnels. The ground under which you are walking has been almost completely excavated. It is best if you don't think about this. <laughs> um, also, another great thing about the city that I like, you don't need a car. I mean, I didn't learn to drive until we moved to the suburbs. And I hate it so much. I hate cars even more than I hate living on top of a boiler. Uh, but yeah, the cars are the worst, and you really don't need one here. But the book was also things like just keeping your eyes open, like just the sort of flora and fauna of the city, I think of it as. And there are just so, they, these, I love standpipes. They have like little personalities to me. So like this one, um, I think of her as Trixie. She's kind of saucy. Um, this, this upper right hand corner one, he's just like sort of like a, a doofus. It's like, do, 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 I'm peeking out, nobody sees me, you know. And then this, this, this is an old couple. They're having a fight. <laughs> and, and he is like, what did I do? What did I do? And she goes, shut up, I'm not talking to you. Um, and then like, what is this? This doesn't even make any sense. It's like this little family of pipes just like suddenly popped up. So I think I kind of wanted, you know, like with this book to just encourage people, like don't just, you know, go to the Statue of Liberty. Like look at everything because this is better, you know. Um, and then what is that? You know, like this is just a crazy thing. And and I could not believe this when I saw it. I was just like, why are people, why are we not all like falling to our knees and just like, oh, you know, hailing to the God of all standpipes. It's uh, it, it just incredible. Um, also, as I talked about, I, I, I love 
I love like in New York, and this still exists, and I know there's, it's not the same, it never will be, it's never as good as it was in the past, blah, 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 blah. But I like when you discover a place, like the more, on the most nondescript street, the more nondescript the street, the greater chance you have of making your own dis discoveries. And you go to these places, it's like they sell 90 bajillion kinds of ribbon. It's so great, or tassels, you know, or so, like, really complicated tassels that like I want all of them except I have no real use for tassels but I kind of want to have use for tassels I just kind of don't yet um, for some reason I've always preferred cities to nature I am interested in the person made I like to watch and eavesdrop on people and uh, New York is like if it's that's the best thing from one of the best things is just hearing bits and pieces of like wonderful conversations. Um, and I really love density of visual information. Um, and that's uh, that storefront, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to go to the gallery, but like that's what I like to see. I like to see the mishmash of different kinds of architecture and when you look up, you know, the, the floors and just the different shapes of windows and, you know, there's one, one, one floor, it's, you know, buttons and the next floor there's a furrier and then there's like import, export, you know, I don't even know what that is. Just, I, I just like that a lot. Um, and also, periodically, we're coming to the end of this part, periodically I get really obsessed with crafts. I don't know what this is, a kind of mania or something. Um, and uh, I got really, really obsessed with making Pisanki eggs at one point. Um, and I must have made a couple of hundred. I, I just, I love, love, love doing it. Um, and Pisanki is, uh, they're not painted, they're regular chicken eggs. Um, nothing special about them. You don't paint them, you draw on them with wax and the melted wax, and then you dip them into vats of dye that are like nothing like those crap dyes that you get in the supermarket, like pas or something they're called, uh, that are so pale and gross. These are specially made for dyeing pisanki eggs. And I met somebody who taught me the, the traditional technique, um, and, and I saw that it could actually be adapted to my style and how much fun it was. That was just great. Um, and here's some, some other ones. And it was just fun to also play with the trope of an egg and what kinds of, you know, things you could do with drawing in the round and how funny it was, like, to draw people sitting on a bus, but it's like an endless bus, kind of, because it just goes all the way around. Just, I don't know, it was fun. Um, and this is Charles Adams. He liked to draw on eggs also. Um, with, and these are just wonderful, I think. They're not Pisanki eggs, but they're still... You know, I can just tell from looking at them, like, the challenge and fun that he had of, of using eggs. Um, I also really got into hooking rugs. This is not anything to do with those latch hooking kits. This is uh, what, what are they, not pilgrims, what are they called? Pioneers, pioneer people, like, in the wet covered wagons, when they, when they, 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 they used, the clo clothing was so, rare and hard to come by that they didn't just like throw out an old shirt. They would like tear it up into strips and then weave it through burlap um, to make rugs. And so that's, this is called primitive rug hooking. And um, I don't do that. I do buy the burlap and then there's a tool where you put strips of wool. And so these are all wool strips. Um, this is the first one I made and um, it was really fun because a friend of mine gave me scraps and um, Kits, kits are kind of stupid. I do not recommend them because, like, with a kit, like, if you, do, oh, by the way, I like birds a lot. These are my two birds. Um, it, with a kit, like, if you were doing a gray bird, they would give you a bag of gray strips. I mean, what is more boring than that? With, with this, it, since I didn't have enough gray strips, I had to, like, mix up all the different colors and see what would happen, and that was interesting. Um, this is another rug. Um, just very silly um, and fun. This is the largest one I did, and I think uh, one of the last ones I did because it was just insane. Um, my father used to have these crazy breakfasts where he, he took everything out of the refrigerator at once, and he didn't eat it all at once. Like, he would have a bite of this and a bite of that. It would drive my mother, like, insane. But he had to have it all in front of him. Um, so, you know, all the different things, the borscht, the shav. I don't know if you know what shav is. Shav is disgusting. Shav is, it's made from buffalo grass, and he liked it. I mean, he liked borscht, and that was nice. It was a nice purple. Shav, 
looked like snot. It looked like a bowl of mucus. And, and then he would add like sour cream or cottage cheese to it and sort of like stir it around. And it was just like, it would almost make me faint from like gagging at how gross it was. Um, and then re more recently I got like seriously into um, embroidering. And uh, this is one of my very favorite quotes for reasons that will become obvious when I read it. When a writer is born into a family, the family is finished. Uh, it's a quote from a Polish poet whose name I will botch the pronunciation of, uh, Czeslaw Milos. Um, but yeah, uh, that is true. Um, and this is another embroidery. Uh, I like robots. Um, and this is uh, a cover I did uh, about a year and a half or so ago for The New Yorker. It was their tech issue, which also happened to fall on, um, on uh, Mother's Day, the week of Mother's Day. And it's a motherboard. Uh, but it's, it's actually embroidered on a piece of uh, muslin and um, hand embroidered. And uh, yeah, it was really kind of, it was crazy to do and crazy to photograph. And I don't think they've ever photographed embroidery for a cover. And I don't know if they ever will again. <laughs> um, but I was glad they did. Uh, um, and the thing that I'm sort of obsessed with now, right now, is my iPad. And um, which is, I, it's just, it's like the opposite of drawing with a rapidograph pen, which is so scratchy. This is so smooth. And I've been posting stuff to Instagram. I don't know if any of you guys are on Instagram, but I've been posting a lot to that. Um, uh, this is, uh, I've been posting some dreams. I like, uh, I'm, I'm interested in dreams. I think they're kind of like, it's like free material. So uh, um, these are all true. This is, this dream is set in a handmaid's tale-ish future where I am a mannequin. Real me, 60-something, nondescript, generally clothed, flats. Dream me, 20-something, tall, thin, naked, stilettos with wheels. <laughs> My owner was a Dan... Don Draper, John Hamm type of guy who wheeled me around from place to place. Needless to say, this was a patriarchy. She is quite the looker, old man. I kept a diary, even though I knew it was against the rules. Um, last night, I dreamed about Danny DeVito. I like Danny DeVito. He's hilarious, and it's always sunny in Philadelphia, but I don't think about him very often. In my dream, he was lying with his head in my lap, gazing up at me with love, and I thought, I'm not in love with him, but it's nice to be adored, so maybe this will work out. <laughs> um, and this is also done on the iPad. Um, in early October, I got shingles, and, um, <laughs> and this was sort of what I just sort of imagined, like what was inside my body, um, and it was really fun to draw and just kind of go a little bats with it. Um, and the other, this is another iPad thing, um, just being able to sort of take a photograph. This is a picture I took at this strange rooftop bar in Flushing, um, which was almost completely deserted and overlooked this industrial wasteland. And at, I was there at sunset, and it was wonderful, and um, very, very moody and great. And uh, I was able to sort of draw this very tall lady sort of waiting in whatever that water was. Um, and I'm going to close up with a few cartoons here. This is the Holy Trinity, uh, salt, butter, and sugar. Uh, I love uh, the end of the world, guys. And, um, and this is another tombstone joke, tuned in, turned on, dropped out, dropped in, worked out, saved up, dropped dead. And that's it. That's it. Your graphic memoir about your parents, I recommend it to everyone. And what I say is, it is at the same time the most hilarious and most depressing book <laughs> I've ever read. Thank oh, you. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Have you ever considered an animated series? Um, I actually, about 12 years ago, did a, uh, a pilot for ABC Family, which I'm happy to say did not work out. Um, I did not know what I was doing. Um, and by the time I was finished, we made an animatic. Um, by the time I was finished with that, uh, then I wanted to start. But you know how it is. I learned a lot. Uh, but yeah, sometime maybe. Um, what is uh, uh, what is your creative process, and how long do you typically spend on each cartoon? Uh, well, that really varies a lot because um, some of them 
are just more simple drawings, although that, you know, sometimes I think it's a simple drawing and then I start drawing it and I just can't get it right. I mean, I think one of the hardest things is that sometimes when I do a sketch, the sketch has something in it that I can't get again in the finish. Uh, and so I struggle for that, you know, for the same spontaneity or the same facial expression that's in the first draft of it, the first sketch. Um, so it really varies. I mean, there's times where a drawing might be like 45 minutes, and then there's times where it might be several hours, you know, more or more. Um, especially the ones that are color. Color always takes a long time. I love doing color, but it takes a very long time for me. The question was about rejected cartoons and do I ever resubmit them, and I absolutely do. Um, we all do. Uh, the, the, especially if I like believe in it, if I think there's a joke there, and I, they, I just haven't, but I usually redraw it. I usually rework it in some way because I can get like a dog with a bone about a joke if I think it's, or a cartoon, if I think it's a good idea. I, I'll make a note on the back when I've submitted it so I can tell, oh my God, I've submitted this one like four times already. Maybe I should give it a rest. But, um, you know, you never know. And sometimes you just change something up. And as you said, the timeliness can change. Something that was not timely, you know, made no sense, you know, three years ago might make more sense now. So, yeah, I do. Hi, um, embroidery isn't a quick process. How no. long did it take you to do the motherboard cover? <laughs> that was bananas. That was uh, a lot of hours. I, I ne didn't really keep track. Um, I, ha I sometimes I have a little bit of an insomnia situation. <laughs> um, so sometimes I'm up pretty late, and it can just be, you know when, when you're up at like, one and you're not sleepy and then you start to think well, it doesn't really matter it's two three what difference does it make you know when there's a certain kind of like middle of the night sort of time that doesn't you know really matter um so it was m a lot of hours but i liked it you know it was fun i um i just wanted to say two quick things one i have your i'm a therapist and i have your itemized Oh. The cartoon of the itemized yeah, um, the chart. <laughs> chart for a yeah. therapist. The sympathetic clucks are like fifteen dollars, which yeah, yeah. I keep on my file cabinet, and it gives me a lot of comfort <laughs> at work. Okay. But also, I wondered where that Ganesh of the the standpipe is in New oh. York. Do you know what street? Do you remember what street it, it is? It was somewhere around like East Nineteenth, East Eighteenth, somewhere in that vague area, um, and maybe like. I'm trying to think, was it with maybe like near U Union Square or something? I think in that general area. Yeah, it's just so exciting to see that. <laughs> how, how, how does a New Yorker come up with uh, covers? You uh, told us about the cartoons. Oh, where, where, where do the covers come from? Um, the covers, I think it varies from person to person. I think sometimes, like for political things, um, I think Barry Blitt might get called on for things a lot. Um, a lot of times there's just a lot of seasonal stuff and we all submit. Um, occasionally I've gotten called, like, do you have any ideas about this or that? Uh, but I imagine I'm not the only one getting called, you know. Um, I, I'm really not that familiar with the, how, how the whole cover thing works. Um, well, I was just curious, since there aren't a lot of women cartoonists at The New Yorker, how you were accepted, received, how that worked for you? Um, well, I have to say one thing. For, Emma Allen is now the cartoon editor, and she's a woman, the first woman mm -hmm. cartoon editor, and there are many more cart cartoon cart women cartoonists at The New Yorker now. Um, I never, I think, I, I tend to be very much in my own world in, in a little way, and I think being female was one of like a constellation of a lot of problems. Like, um, like I, I was very socially awkward. Um, I know, big shockeroo, right? Um, uh, I uh, I was 23. I was like 10 years younger than everybody. My cartoons were weird looking. Um, there were just so many other issues besides being female that I felt alienated by. But um, I, I don't know. I, I liked all the people that I dealt with. Um, 
not every single one of them, but I would say most of them were just very good people, uh, even though they were guys. Um, so no, I, I didn't really, that wasn't a problem that I had. Um, I love all of the uh, personal material that's worked its way into your cartoons. How old are your children? Are you a grandmother yet? Are you ready to be a grandmother? And will we be seeing booby and grandchildren oh. cartoons in the future? Oh, these are such personal questions. No, no. Um, yeah, my, my children are, I hope they're not in the audience. They're, uh, one, of my, one of them is 31, and he just got married. So, yeah, you never know. And, um, and am I ready? Yeah, I guess you might say I kind of am. It's, you know, really sort of interesting uh, to be a grandmother, yeah. Uh, but, you know, no pressure. Um, you know, uh, even though every day we walk one step further to the grave. Um, and, uh, yeah, and the other one is 27, so a little time, but. All of the city images, uh, do you draw them from your memory, from photographs, or do you go to streets and kind of... I like to draw from my memory. I really do. I do take pictures of things I like, but... Um, and, and this is just, you know, my own bias. I had a teacher in high school who... Uh, um, and I know this is kind of stupid, but I had a teacher in high school... Um, who I really admired a lot and who was really supportive of my drawing cartoons. And I kept, you know, I did all these, I drew a lot when I was in high school, like these notebooks, these sketch pads that are on view in the gallery. And one time um, I brought in these drawings I had done where I had gotten a book of photographs of movie stars uh, from the 20s and 30s. And I had done these pencil copies of the photographs. And I was so impressed with myself, I cannot even tell you. They just looked it was like, they looked exactly like the photograph. And he just looked at me and he said, don't copy photographs. And, and I've had that experience a few times, like with things where like, when I first went to RISD, um, I would see like somebody, you know, drew like the sleeve of a garment. And it was like, what the hell? It's like every little wrinkle and it's so incredible. And then it was like, oh my God, they copied a photograph. And to me, there are people who use photographs in their work and it's great. And I mean, David Hockney, there's tons of people who do it and they really, they, it works for them. But for me, maybe it's because they're cartoons. I don't need precision. I'd rather try to remember, try to construct it from what, I remember in my head of what something looks like. That's part of the fun for me. And if I absolutely must, like one time I sold a cartoon about a gerbil on a wheel, and I realized I needed to kind of go to the photographs and look at them and, you know. So yeah, I mean, I will, when I'm in a, backed into a corner, I'll use reference photographs, but I don't like to. Do your kids think you're funny now? Uh, yeah, they do, and I think they're really funny. So we, we make each other laugh a lot. They're, they're hilarious, actually. What do you think about MS Glue? About who? MS Glue. MS. Oh, Elmer's Glue. Elmer's Glue is great stuff. <laughs> Elmer's Glue is very, very good stuff. Um, and the reason I say this is because I, I had a sort of, I had a, a little bit of a kind of traumatic experience with, with rubber cement. <laughs> and. Um, and it's like one of those things where when my daughter was around 14 and starting to make art, I sat her down. I said, you know what? I, I want to have a talk with you, a serious talk. And um, she said, okay, mom. And I said, you have to pay attention to what I'm going to say. Rubber cement is a false friend. <laughs> you know, because it works so great. And then you know what happens? Your drawings turn brown. The patch drops off. You, it's... Elmer's is great stuff. Anyway, this is very boring to anybody who doesn't draw, so I'm sorry. Anyway. Do you have moments when you feel like really uninspired? And if so, what do you do to get past them? Oh, oh, oh my God. I have writer's block, cartoonist block all the time. I mean, it's it's constant. I think that if you if you make art, if this is what you do, especially if you do it for a living, you know, and you're doing it all the time, um, 
what do I do? Sometimes um, I might make myself a cup of coffee <laughs> or I might just get away from the desk for a little while. Um, sometimes I pick up some weird book like the Reader's uh, Guide to Literature, or, uh, you know, and something will make, make me laugh. Uh, I look through weird old catalogs. Um, I have a uh, a stack of like just weird books and catalogs in my office and in my studio. Um, there used to be a magazine in the eighties called snack food. And it was, <laughs> it, it was a real magazine. It was for the snack food industry. And, um, it always makes me laugh. I mean, <laughs> there's like photos, like, do you want to buy this like giant potato extru making chip extruder? And it's just, and, and they have articles about like I, what the ideal chip is, and I learned this great term, mouth clearance. Like, like picture like mouth is garage, chip is car. Is there a good mouth clearance for this chip? So you know, I I try I don't I try not to get too you know hysterical about it, but but also I think doing drawing some or working a little bit and whatever, even if you're just jotting down ideas and making little sketches, um, I feel like there's something like maybe like being a dancer or something that you have to do it to just keep your yourself like limbered up and even if you don't feel like doing it, I mean I don't do an exercise thing so, but maybe it's kind of like that where you just kind of sometimes make yourself do it because if you if you sit down and you think everything I draw has to be the funniest thing that has ever existed ever, and the best thing I ever did, you know, I can almost guarantee that it's like a freeze up. But um, if you just start to think of a way that makes it fun, then it's like less terrible, maybe. Uh, now that you've discovered the iPad, yes, um, uh, which I just did too, um, how are you working mostly digitally now, or do you do your sketches digitally and then finish in, in, in analog, or how do, you, how do you do it? Most of the stuff I do for the New Yorker, I still do on paper. Um, I do the stuff, the iPad stuff, mostly just for fun and experimenting. Um, I have done some sketches, but not the finishes. Uh, I haven't figured out how to sort of like do the resolution thing, and that's because I'm an idiot. Um, and I, 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 I don't know. But I, I hear that there's a new iPad coming out with uh, um, the full version of Photoshop on it. So that could be very interesting. I have two questions. The first is, I'm curious what your parents thought of your work. And the second is, um, were there any challenges to finding your own unique artistic style? And did you ever, you know, you mentioned uh, drawing to look photorealistic. Did you ever, you know, think, oh, maybe I should be more like that or something like that? Oh. Well, those are both very good questions. My parents were very proud of me that I was, especially because of the New Yorker, and you know they were in the school system, and to them, like the New Yorker was like, and it, it is. I mean, they were they knew what the New Yorker was. They subscribed, so that they might not have completely always gotten my sense of humor because you know they were born in 1912, so their sense of humor was, they told jokes, they told like set pieces, like a guy goes to the doctor, da -da 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 -da, boom, punchline. So that was their uh, sense of humor. Um, the other thing was that like the, the one of the worst uh, artistic times I had was actually when I was in art school. And um, because I think I had a style when I, when I came in and one of the things when I was at RISD was um, I think that if you came in with a style, they wanted to sort of break you down, break you away from that, and teach you things about art uh, so that you didn't cling to your style like a little security blanket. And um, it was very hard. It was very, very, very hard. I did not um, feel supported there, uh, and I know I'm not alone in that. You know, I think there's a lot of people that do feel very supported at art school, and then there are people who don't. And um, I, I personally didn't. Um, and uh, my senior year, uh, you know, I think also it was the times. It was the 70s, and cartooning was thought of as like just 
one of the lowest of the low. It was like, first of all, you're drawing representationally. Second of all, you're trying to make people laugh. I mean, what is more tacky than that? Because, you know, at RISD, the thing that would always get like the most attention was like they were very into like video art sort of thing. So there'd be like a monitor with like static, and then there'd be like another monitor with static, and then you'd face the two monitors, and then you'd write like a 12 page paper about it. <laughs> and that's what got attention. That's what got attention. And, you know, my stuff was just not that at all. And um, I, I started out actually in graphic design and I was terrible at it. And then I went into illustration and I found that sort of boring because there were no jokes. And, um, and I had to sort of illustrate things that I didn't care that much about. And, and then I wound up uh, in painting because I was living with painters and I, I thought painting was much more artistic. And I was a terrible painter, but I did feel a lot of pressure to be more artistic at RISD, uh, which didn't really last. Um, I, uh, and you know, when I say that, I say artistic with a capital A, um, like more art, art, what is art? Is it honest? You know, these kind of like, you know, is this art honest? Just these kind of questions that like, thank God, once I got out of art school, it was like, no, nobody ever like, we n n ever talked about that anymore, you know, it was just, uh, you know, well, what do you pay, when is it due, <laughs> you know, um, stuff like that. Uh, and, um, but my last year at RISD, I started drawing for myself again. I did, I got, uh, so I learned that um, you could completely lose your thread and pick it up again. And um, so that was a really interesting thing because, uh, I think art school is, it, it, can be a, it can be a mixed bag. Um, I moved here about a year and a half ago, and I bought your book, um, basically your guide to New York yeah. that you had written for your daughter, yeah. and I used it the same way that your daughter would have used it. Um, sitting on the bus, I was just reading it, you know, on my first ride to work, I got on the wrong bus, it all uh, happened. Yeah. Um, but I was wondering if you've written any other how-tos or guides to places, and if you were to write one now, being an expert on one thing, what would you write about? Oof. Uh, yikes. Well, I'm, I'm working on a book about Brooklyn, but it's not a how-to book. Because I think, you know, as, I don't remember, was it Hubert Selby? Only the dead know Brooklyn. And Brooklyn is, Brooklyn is really, it's a whole other ball of wax. And yeah, I, you've talked almost entirely about uh, your art, but as a cartoonist, your art is completely involved with words and humor, and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that relationship. Well, one of the things about cartooning that I love is that it is, if you like to write, and this is a sort of paraphrase of something that Marjan Sat Satrapi, the woman who wrote that wonderful graphic novel, per Persepolis, um, she said, if you, the thing about cartooning is that if you can write and you can draw, why should you have to choose? And so I love that cartoons are this kind of way to combine the two. And you can do a cartoon that has no words at all. You can do a box that has all words. You know, you don't have to choose. So it, I like that. That's why I'm attracted, I think, to cartooning. Um, so yes, there is, to some extent. I mean, I think we all know we're in this together. Um, and uh, I, one nice thing about, um, about Instagram is that I do see the work of a lot of younger cartoonists. And since I don't go in in person so much, it's a way to connect. And um, yeah, I, I do feel camaraderie with cartoonists. You know, it's not um, most people, I think pretty much everybody who's a cartoonist, you do it because you love it you know, and also maybe because you can't do anything else. Uh, I don't know uh, how many of you read the book, but I'll explain what that, what this uh, guy is talking about. Um, in, in the book, um, there was this one very, very strange, the book about my parents. Um, when my dad was dying, um, and I would be visiting him at the, there was a sort of a, um, a rehab facility near the assisted living place, and I was spending a lot of time there. And, um, and one time, my daughter, who was at the time in high school, um, 
was with her friends and they were doing a Ouija board in her room and she invited me to come in and do a Ouija board with them. And I'm like, I haven't done this since I was like a teenager myself. And, you know, they're kind of creepy, but I don't know. I don't believe in this stuff. Um, and I, but I was curious to see what the kids would sort of do. Um, and uh, she said, Mom, ask it a question. So um, I said the first question that popped into my head, which was, um, uh, will, I think it was, will Grandpa die soon? And... Um, and she said, Mom, that's like so morbid. But I said, that's what popped into my head. I'm going to ask it. And the little planchette, I was really, I was so curious to see what the kids would say, because it was her and maybe three friends and me, that like I was barely, barely, my finger was sometimes not even on it. Um, and uh, I would say I was toking it, uh, touching it only in a kind of token way. And it moved, and it started to spell stuff out. And it was H, E, A, V. And I'm thinking, oh, it's going to say heavy question. Um, but it didn't. It went to E, and then it went to N, and it stopped. And then it started to move again. B, E, C, K, O, N, S. And it stopped. And it was really weird um, because, as I said, I was barely touching it. Sometimes I wasn't touching it at all. And I had no idea what it was going to spell out. And I, I don't know teenagers that say stuff like that. Um, these were certainly not those kind of teenagers either. They were just, you know, regular old 16-year-olds. They don't say heaven beckons. Um, so I have no idea where it came from. Um, it was just really, really strange. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's just a lot of mystery to everything. So um, anyway, maybe that's a good note on which to end this. <laughs> Thank you.